Hello, welcome to Motivating for Positive Change. My name is Rick Cromie, and I'll be your guide from the side as we take a journey today through how do we motivate people? How do we motivate our employees? How do we motivate our staff and our teams to be the very best that they can be? To inspire them, to really perspire. How do we do that? And how can we do that in a productive way, a positive way, a way that doesn't diminish their human dignity? You see, a lot of the ways that we motivate, whether it's in our congregation, as we try to find volunteers, if you're a, if you're a churchman, or if you're a businessman within your uh, workplace, or even in the school, where we try to motivate our teachers and our administrators and other individuals beneath us and our teams, when we try to motivate them to, to, do, um, to do stuff. We use a lot of guilt. We use a lot of gimmicks to get those things done. But what I've learned over the years and really uh, through the School of Hard Knocks and through my own research and just spending a lot of time studying natural motivation is that people today are just growling. They're hungry for something bigger than just a prize, something bigger than just another gimmick or another guilt trip to get them to do what they have a hard time seeing as a reason to get them to do. So what I wanna to do today is I wanna take you on just a very quick journey and I wanna unpack for you the six secrets, and they're really not secrets at all. Uh, these have been around for a long time. What I wanna do is really show you the deep inner human needs that exist and how you as a, as a leader, as a, someone who is charged with, with motivating a team or a staff, that um, you can get it done. You can actually motivate honestly and with integrity. To begin with, I want to actually take you to a passage of scripture from the New Testament. It's one that within Christianity frames a lot of the basis of the faith. But uh, even if you're not a Christian, as I suspect some of my hearers here will not be, it is one that, believe it or not, has a lot of insight as far as how we motivate another person. Uh, let, let me take you to it right now. It's Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9. And it says these words, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. No one can boast. And that's the key. That's the key to motivating honestly. That's the key to motivating with substance. In order to set this whole thing up, I do need to step back and just give you a brief recap on why incentives fail because for many of us we have been we've become so enamored and so wrapped up and so trapped by the incentive game that we can't think anything else we we cannot see any other way to motivate people but to to kind of massage the message with with another bribe or another gift or another prize or or another incentive or another dollar bill or whatever it might be to to get people to do what we have a hard time getting them to do just on their own. I want to share with you why incentives fail. And the truth is, the more we research, the more we spend time looking back and peeling back the curtain, in many ways, what I'm going to share with you is kind of like that scene from The Wizard of Oz, where at the very end, the curtain is peeled back and you find the great Wizard of Oz is actually just a frail old man, desperately trying to keep up his charade. And that's where a lot of us have gotten when it comes to incentivizing and motivating our teams and our staffs. We have built this monster, we've built this great big machine, and the truth is, we know deep down, if we took away those incentives, that it would demotivate. We know we have to keep getting bigger and better with them if we're gonna succeed at all. And the problem with that approach is that it treats people like animals. And I'm gonna show you how that works more in a moment. But for right now, let me just give you a few reasons why incentives fail. And I'm gonna frame a lot of my thinking today. There, there's a couple individuals in the educational arena. It was a man by the name of Alfie Cohn who wrote a book back in 1993 titled Punished by Rewards that really got me thinking about this. 
But more recently, a man by the name of Daniel Pink has released a book called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And for those of us who are leaders, I would highly recommend you get this book. It fits into exactly what I'm talking about today, and he will challenge the sacred cows, and he will show with some great amount of research why doing the incentive route, why using bribes and gifts and gimmicks and even guilt simply do not work for the long run. Daniel Pink uh, shares, and, and I would concur, that there are some reasons why rewards fail. And in general, these are some that I've, I've discovered. First of all, incentive-based motivation invites shortcuts. You want your employees, you want your volunteers, you want your workers to take shortcuts on the job or in the or on the, in the work that they're doing, then use incentives. Because what happens is when we have an incentive, basically what we do is we focus people on the prize or the, the bribe or the, the thing that's out there rather than on the job that needs to be done. And people will do anything they can to reach towards that. And so incentive-based motivation actually invites shortcuts. We see it all the time. One of the classic examples is actually out of the educational arena with a program that Pizza Hut likes to say is a very effective reading program, and it's called Book It. But I've talked with educators and I've talked with a lot of students, and they will tell you, and they've told me and they've confessed to me, Book It doesn't work at all. The truth of the matter is, yeah, for a few it might motivate them to read more, but in general what it does is it invites shortcuts and, and as our second point will show, even cheating. People, uh, these kids out there when they're reading these books, they're, they're reading for the pizza, they're not reading for the book, they're not reading for value of reading, period. And so they take shortcuts. Secondly, it does invite cheating. Uh, whenever you put those incentives out there and people, the bigger the incentive, the more they will try to cheat. A, a classic example of this is in the, is in the, the game show, the reality-based game show uh, Survivor or, or even The Apprentice and some of these other types of, of games where there's, there's a big prize at the end and, and they, they're, they're focused more on the prize than they are on the process. And that's the issue here. Incentive-based motivation invites cheating and we just need to be cautious about that and aware of that and finally it might surprise you that in the end incentive based motivation invites apathy as well the issue here is very simple when we focus people on something that that is that they that's desirable something that they want something that is is tangible there that 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 just trips or trigger in whatever way, whether it be money or a nice big prize or whatever, uh, it actually takes their mind off of the job itself or the task itself. Uh, let, let me illustrate. It's kind of like saying, uh, you, we're gonna, for every, every night for supper, I want you to eat spinach, but if you eat your spinach, I'm gonna let you have ice cream, and you'll never get to eat ice cream any other time, except when you eat your spinach. What's that tell you about the spinach? <laughs> Say, the, the, the thing is spinach is good for you and ice cream's okay too in, in moderation. But you get the idea that if, I've gotta, if I ever want to get the ice cream, I've got to eat the spinach, you, you go through the mundane in order to get to the ice cream. And here's the thing, once you take the ice cream away, people stop eating the spinach because they're only focused on the ice cream. Same thing with incentives. When you remove the incentive, and you see this in some of these big sports contracts out there. You watch these guys and, and gals, but especially the guys in, in the big time sports, when they have incentives in their contract, they do really well in that last year of contract because they're trying to get those incentives. They're trying to build a better contract for next year. And as a result, they, they actually prove my point. A lot of these athletes in their down years are truly down. Apathy apathy. So we need to be careful in, in, in how we use these incentive-based motivations. And let me just say, do rewards work? Absolutely they work. <laughs> There's no one that will deny that they work. But the problem is, why do they work? And Daniel Pink says this, he says, in other words, rewards can perform a weird sort of behavioral alchemy. Alchemy is just another word for magic or, or even witchcraft. They can transform an interesting task into a drudge. They can turn play into work. 
And I'm gonna actually suggest to you that if you wanna motivate your employees, if you wanna motivate your staff, you have to turn, turn work into play. Not play, into work. So incentives actually work against the natural motivation that every person has. Alfie Cohn makes this statement in his landmark work on educational, uh, as far as using rewards in the educational environment. He says the question is not whether more flies can be caught with honey than with vinegar, but why the flies are being caught in either case and how this feels to the fly. In the final judgment, in the final analysis, incentive-based motivational techniques, they do always work. No one denies that but they only work in the short term. And if you want to motivate naturally, if you want to motivate people to go for the long run, to do things for the long, for the long haul, you gotta motivate differently than rewards. Secondly, and this is crucial, rewards have to keep getting bigger and better in order to continue to motivate. And you gotta be careful because the first time someone feels jilted or cheated or, or whatever by the reward, uh, it totally demotivates them to do it again. And, and this is the problem again with rewards is, and, and these type of gimmicks is that you have winners and really most everybody else is a loser. And I want to challenge that thought. If you want a winning workplace, if you want a, if you want a volunteer staff that truly goes the extra mile, you have to up your game and make it a winning place all the way around. You're a winning team, you're a winning group, you're a winning organization, you're a winning congregation, and you're winning because you're all in it together. There are no losers. Everybody's a winner. And you have to remove the rewards and the gimmicks and the guilt in order to get there. Does that make sense at all? Well, hopefully I'm, I'm challenging some of your paradigms and I don't expect to get everyone to uh, agree, but all I can say is for myself, I was the king of the gimmicks. And once I removed, once I stepped away, and once I started doing things a little bit different, um, things changed incredibly for me as far as how I motivated people. And today I can honestly say that what I'm about ready to share with you as far as natural motivation does work. And these natural needs, these inner needs that we all have, actually are in direct contradiction to everything incentives do. In fact, by adding incentives, you actually demotivate people in, in the process and work against those natural needs. The starting point to understanding natural motivation is a very simple phrase. Feed the need. Feed the need. In contrast, when we use incentives, what we're doing is we're feeding the greed that exists within people. And that's a natural thing too. People will, will clamor for that type of thing. They will claw their way for that type of thing. They will clobber their way for those type of things. But that does not create unity. That does not create a positive situation in the end. What we want to do is we want to feed the need. Feed the need. And to get us thinking about this, I want you to take a look at this picture. Isn't that a good one? I'll tell you, that steak, uh, that's a big, big slab of, of beef there, and you got some shrimp, and you know, just a, that's got a little potato there in the background. I mean, that's a great meal, is it not? You know, the truth is, if you start to think about that long enough, and depending on the time of the day and when you're watching this, something may actually happen deep down inside you. It, it's something that uh, biologists or doctors or physicians or people who study the bo body, they know very, uh, very well as the borborygmies. The borborygmies. The borborygmies are nothing more than the technical term for the stomach growls. You see, our stomach growls when it's hungry. It, make, it rumbles, it rolls, it's, it's basically saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. And deep down inside every single person, there are six basic human needs. And, and these are my human needs. And, and for what it's worth, as I started to study natural motivation, I went to the work of other people out there who have who studied this, and there's some excellent work. Uh, many, um, many great uh, psychologists and sociologists and other individuals who've really looked at this and and such. But I wanted to um, I wanted to look at myself and try to try to put it in a in a frame that could be easily remembered. You know, for example, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're going to hear a lot of that in in the next several minutes. 
Maslow's hierarchy of needs, most people cannot rip off. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't know them. It, it's, you know, we know that there's some basic needs and again, maybe self-actualization, that's the highest level. But unless you've studied it out and really have, have adopted and used it within your own personal life and your, your leadership skills and, and acumen, chances are it, it doesn't go anywhere. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't recite Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then there's a man by the name of William Glasser and, and control theory, which had a huge impact upon me. And as I was reading Glasser, I was going, yes, yes, this guy gets it. Uh, and another guy by the name of Rudolf Dreikers when it came to classroom management and, and the natural needs and how it's important for belonging and, and relationships and all those things are key to, to keeping engagement going on in the classroom. But in the same thing in the workplace, you know, Glasser was saying that there are five basic needs in his case. And he talked about the need for power and the need for freedom and the need for belonging and relationship and the, the need for uh, basic survival or, or safety needs, security needs. You know, fun was another one of his. You know, when you look at those those needs, we, we can understand them, but again, they're hard to remember. And as I was thinking about this and, and this whole idea of, of the growls, the stomach growls, it dawned on me, too, that a lot of these individuals, I think, were missing a very deep spiritual need. Now, for what it's worth, I think Maslow and Glasser will both say that what I'm about to say in this first need is really there in theirs, you know, maybe it's within their freedom or within self-actualization, but I really want to define it even better. So you ready? You ready to go with me? Your people, your volunteers, your employees, your staff, they are hungering right now. They are starving for needs to be met. Their stomachs are growling for you to naturally motivate them. And if you do these things, you're going to find um, that you won't need to gimmick or guilt them at all to get them to do something. Just spells growls. It's pretty simple. G-R-O-W-L-S. Learn it, love it, live it. Here we go. G. The G is grace. You got to try for the kingdom. You got to try. The G in growls to me is one of the most deepest important needs and it's one that I, I we have to define even better than we have and that's the spiritual need for grace. Deep down inside every single individual we are starving for an unconditional, unbelievable, unfathomable workplace, workspace, volunteer team, whatever we're looking for. We all want those things. When, when we have an unconditional uh, place to serve, a place to work, you know, it, it basically says that I can be me. I, I, can, I can be who I am, or who I believe I've been built to be. And if you believe God, and I believe God creates all of us, you know, be who God has created us to be, obviously. Unbelievable means that I can make mistakes. I can, I can make a mistake and, and it's okay. I can be forgiven of that. I can be freed of that. I can move forward. And it's unfathomable in the sense that I have hope. I can actually move forward and, and have a direction. And when you think about your staff, when you think about your teams, when you think about the individuals that you are leading, you know, let me just give you a few power points to, to really hang your hat on. And it spells free. That's what you want to do, isn't it? You want to free your staff to be who they are. That's called grace. First of all, forgive and forget. Literally, you need to forgive and forget. Now, here's the key. Forgiving, a lot of us forgive, but we don't necessarily forget. In order to bestow grace, though, we have to truly forget. So what's that look like? What's grace look like? What's, what's it mean to forgive and forget? And what's that look like? Well, I always like to point to a scar on my leg. And if you were to look at this scar, you can see it's a pretty ugly scar. It's been there since I was a kid. I got it when I was... Uh, sliding into second base and I accidentally uh, slid over the top of a broken coke bottle tore my knee up something fierce tore up my lower leg and it bled and it was really ugly in fact I probably should have had stitches but uh, we were just too broke 
too poor at that time in our lives to be able to even afford that. So my mom patched up the best she could and I um, limped around for a number of weeks until it finally healed. But it's still there. But here's the thing. I have forgotten all about it. It doesn't control me. I have forgotten about it because it's healed. And, and that's what forgiven and free means. It means that the only thing you remember is when you remember it. <laughs> so when someone has offended you, you know, when you've forgiven them and you've freed them is when the, they no longer offend you. When you don't even think about it until you really think about it. You know, and the problem is that for most of us, we still think about those things. We think about the offenses. And that happens a lot within teams. It also happens between leaders and their, their staff and their, their employees. The R is we need to restore through resources. I mean, face it, our people, are the, the, the ones that we're in charge of with, they're going to make mistakes. And so the best thing to do is not to, to continue to make the same mistake, but to restore them through resources. Nearly every person I talk to, uh, including myself, I can tell you the mistakes that I've made is a lot more because I didn't know any better. And instead of being restored through resources, being, being shown a, a new way or a better way or, or really just given some grace there on how to get it done, um, I was beat down. I was basically lectured to or whatever. People get that all the time. And restore gently through resources, through procedures, whatever that might be. E is expectations. Let me tell you something, if you expect your people to basically mess up and to make mistakes and you're constantly looking out for them to blow it, you're going to get what you're expecting. For me and my staff, what I try to do is I raise the bar. I expect the very best out of them. I, I expect them, yes, occasionally to make mistakes, but I don't expect mistakes to be part of our environment. If we make a mistake, we deal with it, we move on. But the truth is, I expect the very best and I want them to, to perform at the very best that they can be. Excellence and with creativity and with integrity. Expectations. If you create it and command it, they will follow. And then the other E is simply this. The other E is to encourage through surprises. Grace is all about surprises. And a lot of times people hear me and they, they hear me talking about things like, you know, are you saying can the candy or get rid of the, get rid of the prizes and all that stuff. And I, I'm saying yes, if you're using that as a motivator. If they're focusing on that to, to get the job done, then yes, you know, reconsider that. But you can still use prizes, you can still use gifts, you can still use, you know, food or whatever, even, even a nice fat, salary bonus if you want, but you just don't let them know it's coming. They shouldn't be expecting it. If it's a surprise, if it's a free gift, remember that's what Grace is, it's a free gift, it basically sets the stage that I'm going to take care of you and every now and then I'm going to surprise you with something incredible. That's Grace. And if you build a foundation within your workplace, within your ministry, within your, your school, within your home even, of grace, you're going to find that whether they're a child, whether they're an employee, whether they're a volunteer, wherever, a student, they will follow you. Guaranteed. The R in growls is relationship. We all starve and hunger for relationships. We all want to be connected. We all want to fit in and belong. In fact, if you don't belong, it's so long. And I see it all the time in the workplace. I definitely see it a lot in the volunteer teams that, that are out there is that people don't feel like they're fitting in. And you know, the average volunteer in a church actually last three to six months and the number one reason is not because they didn't feel like they couldn't do the job many of them did they didn't feel like they were part of the team I hear that over and over and over again they want to be part of something that that of a team uh, something that connects them a community and so it's very important that you develop 
connection. And, and this speaks to the idea that you communicate. Um, and you're, they're communicating with you that there's some level of interaction there between the leader and your team. It, it's so crucial. And secondly, that there's companionship going on. I mean, if your staff and your team, if your employees feel like, hey, I have friends here. That doesn't mean you hang out after work or after every, every event or every activity, but it does mean that um, you might. <laughs> you might because you have friends there. It's a place where you know everyone's names. It's, it's, you're not a number. You're, you know, in fact, that's the problem with larger businesses is we actually turn a lot of these people into numbers. And the, the truth is that people want to be known. They want to have a name and they want to go someplace and work someplace where they're not just another cog in the wheel, where they actually are part of something bigger. They're part of a community. They're part of a team. They're part of a team. So let me give you some PowerPoints on how you might do this. And I like to use the acronym GLUE because that's what we want to do. We want to glue our teams together. We want to glue our people together. And here's some ways that you can do this. First of all, get to know each individual on your team or your staff personally. Personally. Get to know their interests. Get to know their hobbies. Get to know, you know their families. You know, that way when you're talking with them and it shows that you care about them. I know a lot of leaders who think, well, you know, uh, basically I always thought the leaders were distant. I thought leaders basically stayed away from the people. Well, that's old school. In the new school way, we actually have connection. We actually develop relationship. I call it incarnational uh, work, incarnational leadership. You know. In, in, the, in the scriptures, that's one of the things that's about Jesus, is that Jesus literally was God, and God, God's Son Jesus came down and walked among us. You know, the word Emmanuel means God with us. Hear, the, hear how that drips with relationship? And the, the theological word incarnation just means that God incarnated, came down and became part of His creation. That's what makes Christianity distinct from any other religion, is that whole idea. And it's, it's a beautiful thing, but it's something that we need to also recognize is important for us as leaders to do. We need to incarnate among our teams, among our staff. You know, I, I know some senior ministers who hardly know their staff. They, they, they basically do a great job in the pulpit. They do a great job casting vision, but they have no idea about the personal lives and the stories and the struggles of their staff. It happens over and over and over again. And it happens within schools, between students and teachers. It happens within the workplace, between employees and employers. It happens. Get to know each other personally. L. L is basically limit situations that are prone to isolation. Do you hear me here? You got to limit these situations. There may be, you know, when you think about you have to work all night at a, at a booth or something like that, yes, there's going to be those type of situations, but if you as a leader can be very careful in scripting out the tasks that are there so that none of your individuals, no one actually does a lot of things by themselves. In the area of, of church education, for example, I believe very strongly in team teaching for this reason alone. We, we do not need someone who's by themselves in a class by themselves. First of all, it's hard to recruit to that, but secondly, it, it's a very dangerous situation. It opens up a person for some allegations which may or may not even be true. The U is simply to utilize teams. And again, just building on this, everyone has a partner. Everywhere you go, you have a partner. I, I love how Jesus modeled this within his own ministry. I mean, when he sent people out, he sent them out two by two. You know, he actually, utilize teams, teams of three, teams of four, teams of two. Whatever we do within the workplace, whatever we do within our congregations, work within a team process. And then finally, endear through appropriate touch. Now here's what I mean by that. There's a lot of inappropriate touch. I think we can agree with that. But at the same time, in a high-tech world, we are a high-touch culture. Our world our culture struggles. We want reality. We want to be known. And one of the ways that I do that is just simply by putting my hand on the shoulder of someone when I'm talking to them. Or as I shake their hand, you know, shake it firmly and just let them know that I am connecting with them. Endure through appropriate touch. 
glue them together. Relationship. If you build it, they will glue. The O in growls is ownership. It's the second ship that sails. Relationship is the first ship to sail. Ownership is the second ship to sail. And ownership is very crucial. In fact, it is critical because from the day we're born, and, and you see it expressed particularly within a toddler, but from the day we're born, we're control freaks. We all want to be large and in charge. We all want to be in the, the, the masters of our own destiny. We all want to own. We all want to empower, be empowered to, to do what, what we believe we can do. And that's why it's so important. So what we want to do is we want to give control to people. And too many leaders are the opposite. They want to have all the control themselves. But as I'm going to talk about in another session here about leading from the edge, what we're finding is that when we empower people and we give them control, we actually become better in our own leadership and, and in the, the breadth and the depth of, of our organizations. Control just simply means that I can do it. If you notice a little kid, the first thing they say is, me, 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 or I can do it, I can do it, I want to do it, or even no. These are all exertions of control. Secondly, choice. You know, every one of our employees, every one of our volunteers, everyone on our staff or our teams, they want to know that they have options. And too many of us, what we do is we take away the options. We limit the, the possibilities. And it should be the opposite. Give your team and your staff options and choices. And third, just help them to be a contributing person within the, the environment. I mean, contribution is, is key. When people don't feel like they're productive, when they don't feel like they're, 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 they're making a difference, they will basically eventually leave. I would say that's the number one reason why I have left many situations in my life. The number one reason, whether it's as a volunteer for a team or whether it's you know maybe even going to a different church or maybe it's leaving for a different job, it's because I felt at, at eventually there came a point, a tipping point for me where I went, you know what, would I really be missed if I wasn't here? You know, am I really needed? Am I even wanted? See, those are deep human needs that we all have. And the more that you empower, empower, empower your team and your staff, the better it will be. So, an acronym is basically you want them to own. Let me give you three tips on how you can do this and develop ownership. First of all, original ideas are always welcome. Original ideas. Now here's the problem with original ideas is that some of us, and I was one of these individuals, we're fairly creative ourselves. And so when I was sitting down with my teams in the early years, we'd be doing one of these brainstorm things, and I would do what I call the dress up afterwards. Uh, here's how it worked. Uh, you know, Sandy over here would basically be give a fantastic idea of something that we would should do. And then I would look at her and I would basically say, you know what, that's a great idea, Sandy. But what if we did this? And what if we did that? And what if we did this? And basically through my own creativity, I dressed up her idea to the point where it may or may not even look like the original idea. So next time Sandy has an idea in a team meeting, do you think she's going to share that? Yeah. She's learned her lesson. And I learned my lesson and it took me a while to work myself out of that. What I tend to do now is this, is when I hear a great idea like that, is I open it up to the entire team. I say, you know what, Sandy, that was a fantastic insight. That's a great idea. You know, um, do you think that there's some other things we could do with it? You know, what, what's the rest of you think? Let's, let's just brainstorm because Sandy's given us a great door to get started here. And if you don't mind us just talking about your idea, and usually Sandy goes, no, no, let's talk about it. See, it becomes her idea for us to dress it up, not mine. And I invite her into the process because her idea, as good as it might be, maybe I know as a leader is not the best it can be. And that's what great leaders do. They bring out the very best in all of their people. Original idea is always welcome. W, work staff according to their gifts. This is going to be key. And in fact, in the future, I really believe that businesses and places, or churches and organizations, we're going to hire talent over uh, a job description. 
You see, the old school idea was there was a job description, and what we did is we went out trying to find somebody who could match the job description. That's not happening today. In fact, a lot of us are finding out that job descriptions aren't working because a person comes in and maybe they match the job description initially, but things change. Job descriptions have to change. Instead, what we're finding and what's happening out there on the very edge is that businesses are starting to hire talent. Organizations are starting to hire talent first, and then they just find a spot for them. They may not even know where they're going to work, but they go, we want you because we believe you've got what it takes to help us out. We don't know where we're going to put you, but we're going to give you this amount of money. Would you come along with us? That's the type of environment. And so work them to their, to their gifts. Many of our volunteers do not feel like they're being used productively. They don't feel like their gifts are being used uh, productively. So we have to know what their gifts are. We have to do some analysis of, of their gifts and their skills. The end is to nourish responsible compliance to policies, policies and procedures. Here's what I mean by that. Nourish responsible compliance. We're going to talk more about compliance to policies and procedures in a later, later point. But right now, we need to understand it's responsible compliance. The reason that we agree, the reason that we go along with a policy or procedure, even if we don't like it, is because it's the responsible thing to do. It's the best thing for everybody here. Maybe it's not the best thing for me, but as a team, as a group, we all work together. That's how I leveraged my policies and procedures. You know, I would never create a policy or procedure just for one person. That would be silly. Policies and procedures are for everybody to come in and to agree to. And so it's key, it's, it's essential that we understand that these are responsible compliances. And that when I basically sign on to be part of a volunteer staff or be an employee or, or be part of a team under you, that I'm signing on to these policies, these procedures. Make sense? Ownership. Give them power. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. growls is worth. Now if you're hanging with me, <laughs> and I bet you are, I hope you're starting to see something. Because think about it. G is for grace, R is for relationships, O is for ownership, W is for worth. Now I'm going to talk about worth in just a moment. Let me just stop right there. G-R-O-W. What's that spell? Bingo. Grow. If you want to grow a healthy team environment, if you want to grow a healthy staff, if you want to grow a healthy workplace, if you want to grow a healthy uh, volunteer ministry, whatever it is, you have got to concentrate on developing a, a bottom line of grace. I mean, that's the foundation. And then building upon that community, relationships, empowering people, and then finally, you got to let them know they're valued. You've got to let these individuals know that they have worth in your program. You see, part of the problem with incentives is they treat people like they're dogs. I mean, think about it. In fact, that's really where the whole incentive thing came from. I don't know if you know the history of incentives, but it comes out of the school of behaviorism. Guys like Ivan Pavlov and B.F. Skinner and John Watson, who were themselves working from an idea that had just emerged in the last 50 years from Darwinian evolution. It was the idea that we are basically nothing more than highly evolved animals. And so Skinner and Pavlov, those type of individuals, basically said that and Skinner was an atheist. He didn't believe in God at all. So that you can see where this would guide him in his thinking. He basically said, what we do is we treat people like animals. We can trick or train them just like we do a dog or a rat. You know, no wonder it's a rat race within a lot of our um, workplaces or our ministry environments. Because what happens is we, if we treat them like dogs, you know, they, they do what we want them to do. We throw them, we throw them a treat. Oh, good, good dog, Fido. Throw them a treat. You know, good dog, good dog, good. We throw them a treat. And then what happens is when we take the treats away, we, we're, we're surprised when they growl and bite us. <laughs> the thing is this. As a Christian, 
I will tell you my foundational belief is that we are created in the image of God. That's what it says in the book of Genesis. Each and every human being has worth because we are created in the image of God, not dog. And that's where I think we have it all backwards. And until you value people as created in the image of God rather than dog, you're never going to get it. Feeding the natural needs is focusing upon what they're worth. Value basically it says I, it means I have a unique purpose. Vision means I have unique dreams. And voice means I can uniquely contribute. See, it's more than just being empowered to contribute. It means that I'm different from Sally or I'm, I'm different from John over here. I'm a, I have a unique gift. I have a unique purpose. I have a unique opportunity. Every person is different. Well, let me give you some PowerPoints on how you might do this. And the idea here is we simply want to pat people on the back and let them know job well done. So there's just three I want to share with you on this. First of all, positive, substantive praise. Learn it, love it, live it, use it. And here's what I mean by substantive praise. Too many of us, when we, as leaders, what we do is we come along somebody and we say, hey, nice job, I really appreciate your work. Uh, we, we think that that's praise, but the truth is it's empty praise. There's no substance to that. What we want to do instead is we want to identify specifically what they did that was a nice job. We want to identify specifically what they did was good and why we're praising them. Make sense? So I see John and I see that John has been uh, picking up the trash uh, in the corner and has basically went the extra mile and was doing that. And so I come up to John and I say, John, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate the work that you're doing here, picking up the trash. And it, it's really, it saves me some time that I would have to do later. So thank you very much for contributing and being part of the team here and, and going the extra mile for me. See the difference? That's substantive praise. That's positive praise. A. Affirm each person uniquely. So when you come up to John, you can say, John, you know, obviously I appreciate you being my trash man tonight, but the truth is I was watching you tonight also teach those kids. And as you were, as you were teaching them, I could see that you were really excited about it, but also I've been seeing some growth in you, and I've noticed that your teaching abilities really improved. Good work. Thank you for that. Thank you for serving our kids. Affirm each person uniquely. And then finally, T, throw the encouragement into the future. Throw the encouragement into the future. What I mean by that is so many times what we do is we stop right there. But what you want to do is you want to help people to continue to move forward and to be better than they are right now. So you throw it into the future. You say, John, you know what this tells me <laughs> is that not only can you pick up trash and not that you're a good teacher, but I have a feeling that you're going to be one of the best leaders we've ever had around here. You're someone right now that as you continue to, to use your gifts and as you continue to sacrifice for the team and just the things that you're doing, I mean, that's hard stuff and it means a lot to me, but what it tells me and what it shows me is that you have a great future here and I can't wait to see what God is going to do through you because I believe that down the road you're, you're going to be one of, if not one of our best teachers, one of our best leaders. So get ready and anything I can do to help you in that process, let me do that. All right? Thanks, John. There you go. Suddenly John walks away going, wow, I feel like all I did was pick up a little bit of trash. I didn't even know anybody was even watching me teach. And suddenly John is going, I've got a place, I've got a purpose, I'm special, I'm unique. That's worth. G-R-O-W, grace, relationship, ownership, worth. If you use these, if you learn them, love them, live it, you will grow your team and staff naturally. I feel good. I knew that I wouldn't. So good, so good. I got a year. Oh, I feel good. <laughs> I got to tell you, I love this particular need. And I never would have discovered it if it hadn't been for William Glasser. Glasser talked about how deep down inside of each and every one of us, we have a need to have fun. He called it fun. And I, I L, laughter. We all have a need to laugh. We all have a deep desire to just giggle and, you know, <laughs> guffaw and anything else. Just to, to laugh a hell, a hearty bellyache. We, we love it. I, I mean, think about, think about anything that you enjoy. I mean, 
think about, uh, I see people running all the time. You know, they like to jog. <laughs> that doesn't look like fun to me. But you talk to people who like to jog and they'll say, hey, it's something that I truly enjoy. Same way with golf. I'm a miserable golfer. My experience on the, on the golf course has been absolute tragedy. I shot a 69 the first time I was ever out and that was on the first hole. I mean, I'm a poor golfer. And yes, people have taught me over the years and I've improved and now I can somewhat like it. But you know, it's just hard for me to lay down money for it. But you know what I enjoy? I enjoy going out and I like to shop at things like places like pawn shops and thrift stores. I love looking for a deal. I love getting something for next to nothing that somebody else pays a lot of money for. That's always been part of who I was and I just enjoy the hunt of that. I enjoy fishing for these type of deals. That's what I'm talking about here. Laughter, smiles for miles. When your team and your staff and your employees, when they are laughing, when they're having a great time together, when work has become play, you, you just have to sit back and let it happen. They're gonna work harder for you because they enjoy what they're doing. Enjoyment, they like doing it. There's a hint of entertainment to this. And I know, I know, I know a lot of us today, we don't like that word entertainment because we see it as so much, something very shallow and superficial. But the truth is entertainment just simply means it feels good. You know, when, when your volunteers and when your team and your staff gets together, do, do your meetings, do they feel good? You know, do your, do your times together, do they feel good? And then finally, just enthusiasm. And this is key here too. I, I, I don't think we, we recognize this a lot, but the truth is the word enthusiasm comes from two Greek words. It's the word in, for in, in, and theos, for God. The Greek word for God is theos. So literally when we're enthusiastic, we are in God. <laughs> See, it's a great thought. We need to have smiles for miles. Fun is fundamental <laughs> to the workplace and the volunteer environment that you're trying to create. Because if they're not having fun, you're not going anywhere with them. And uh, that, is, that is essential. So let me give you a few PowerPoint tips that spell fun as far as how you might take your staff to the next level and really lighten the load around your, your workplace and your volunteer environments. The app is first of all, foster smiles by smiling yourself. It amazes me how many times I walk around a workplace or I walk around a, a church or an organization and I see the leader and the leader is, you know, the leader doesn't have a smile themselves. No wonder! If you want your volunteers, if you want your team, if you want your staff, if you want your employees to smile, then you've got to be smiling. You've got to make it fun for them. The U, utilize fun resources. Get out there and do some research and do some things and, and find find some stuff that makes whatever you're doing more fun. You know, if you're in a teaching environment, get some curriculum together that's fun to teach. You know, maybe you're going to have to do some work as far as some of the other things that are part of that curriculum. But if it's a fun curriculum to teach, your teachers will enjoy it and you'll be able to teach beyond the rest. You know, in the workplace, what are some of the resources? In your volunteer environments, what are some resources that you can do to make it fun? You know, one of the things I always do with all my volunteers is we had a, we, we, we would just, just get out and have fun together. You know, I would, we'd go to ball games together or, you know, I would, a, a staff t-shirt, just anything like that that not only showed that we were a community, but that way we had fun and what we did. That was the number one reason why people told me they didn't like to leave my staff. They said it was just too much fun. And the number one reason why people left my staff was because it was no longer fun. That's key. The end, nurture an environment of play. Can you do that? Can you just create an environment where it's okay to just let down your hair and to have fun? You know, um, my uh, wife works at a home improvement store. And I've had this, uh, this too as well. There's been times where she goes to work very early in the morning and works off hours before the store opens. I remember one time I was working for another store and we had to, some of us stock boys had to stay overnight. And we were told there's certain things we had to get done. But you know, the truth is we did a lot of playing that night as well. I remember getting on the bikes and riding bikes up and down the aisle and stuff. It was just fun. And our, our team, team manager said, hey, no problem. As long as you don't break anything, feel free to enjoy and we did and it was cool it made the hours go by much faster and the work much lighter nurture in an environment of play it's key
Finally, there is the S in safety and security. And you can really put those two words together if you want to just make them one. I've pretty much landed now on just security. I think security encompasses safety as well. But safety is the idea that there are no physical needs. There's no nothing physically that can cause harm or danger in the environment, in the context of which your workers or your team are operating. Security deals more with emotional need, that you feel emotionally secure. You know, there, there are a lot of workplaces, for example, that are ripe with dysfunction. And one of the reasons why there's huge turnover is all you have to do is walk into the break room and listen to people talk about each other. There's bullying going on, there's abuse, there's emotional abuse, there's verbal abuse. You know, uh, one of the reasons why I would have a no profanity zone at work is because for some people that's offensive talk. And when people use profanity, except in a situation by accident or they let one blurt by mistake, there's where grace comes in. But I gotta tell you, you show me a workplace where there's profanity going on, and I'll show you a place where there's some emotional abuse happening as well, and and maybe even some other types of discrimination. And people just simply do not feel secure in those situations, um, especially when the targets start to come towards them and the abuse starts to come their way. Safety and security is totally key to this process. So to create a safe and secure environment, let me just give you four PowerPoints to do that. Number one, stop making excuses. Safety is job one. So as you look at your workplace, as you look at your church, your building, your facility, your organizational area, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, if you've got situations that are unsafe, where people can get hurt, you need to put your full attention to that now. You need to create a place where your workers, your volunteers feel safe. Uh, let me just for a moment talk to those who are involved with children's ministry. You know, I, I hear every now and then when I work with children and children's leaders, they talk about how they have kids in their environment, kids in their classes that sometimes bite them. And to me, this is an example of where you have to stop making excuses. There should never be a reason for a kid to intentionally bite a teacher. And if they do, they need to be removed. Because you show me a child that's biting, and I'm going to show you a situation, especially if they're biting a teacher, but even if they're biting another kid, you, that child needs to be removed and dealt with through a parental help or through some other things first before they're allowed back in because it creates insecurity in the classroom. And it makes insecurity a part of the teacher's frame as well. I mean, how can you teach if you know that you're going to have issues, that you're going to potentially be bit? Another thing, and for those of you who pay are in pay situation or employees, you need to realize that it's important for you to meet family needs. One of the reasons why a lot of people today are really struggling is because their jobs no longer pay the bills. And so you have to look, and, and I realize everybody's got tight wallets, but if you can, the, the secret to, to, to doing it well, I was just reading the other day about Five Guys Burgers and Fries and one of their secrets as far as how they retain their employees is they pay everybody above minimum wage. They also honor some of the other growls that I've talked about here. They make it a fun place to work. They, they have a lot of uh, empowering moments where, where people can, uh, their, their staff can, can feel like they're contributing. Uh, it's also a graceful environment. But they stop making excuses. They realize Number one, we don't have, we could pay the minimum like everybody else does in fast, convenient food, as they like to call it, or we could actually bump it up and get, get better employees, which they've done. Stop making excuses. A, always measure twice, cut once. I don't think I need to talk about this too much because you understand what I'm saying. It comes out of the area of, of woodworking and, and, and where you literally measure twice and then you cut once. Uh, sometimes what happens is we don't measure right the first time and it, it's important to measure twice and cut once rather than you know creating a mistake. If you get that mentality within your teams to always measure twice, cut once, it's, it's going to help out. It's going to solve a lot of the problems. F. Free your staff by meeting basic needs. Again, look around. What are the basic needs? Are they hungry? Do they, do they need drink? Do they need sleep? <laughs> Whatever it might be, meet those basic needs. Um, I, I know of some workplaces now that actually have a, a sleep zone. They, they let their, their staff, if they've worked nine, uh, if they've worked upwards to eight hours, to take a half hour nap in the afternoon. 
and they just go back to the couch and lay down. They encourage them to do that. It's part of meeting basic needs. People just don't get enough sleep today. Um, finally, E is to encourage compliance to all policies. I talked about this earlier. It's essential that you have policies in place that protect people, that protect your business, that protect your work environment. But that also means that you have to get everybody to comply to those policies. And you may have some individuals, including some upper level management, upper level team members that will basically say, well, that's good for those guys, but it's not good for me. I don't have to comply. No, everybody complies. We're all in this together. All for one, one for all. That's how it works. Safety and security. Let me close with just this basic thought on how safety and security works and really how this, just a, a fun little story that, that comes out of my personal family a few years ago. Uh, it was after church. My family, we were eating at a local Mexican restaurant. And we had just gotten our chips and salsa and sat down and, and was enjoying the time when my son, who was 16 years at the time, and my, my wife, uh, we've been married for 28 years, and, and my daughter is, uh, is 20, 21 at that time. Now she's close to 24. But my son, who was 16 at the time, blurted out, I finally know what women want. <laughs> uh, of course, that caught my attention because I have no clue what women want. I, I just, you know, I kind of go blindly through the process of trying to understand the fair sex. Uh, but my son says, I finally know what women want. And of course, it, I looked over and my daughter and my wife, Patty, both of them looked at Ryan and went, uh, really, you know what women want. And I said, okay, I give, what do women want? He says, it's simple, dad, they just want security. Now, when I share this with my audiences live, especially if I'm in a situation where there's a lot of women, I always hear, ah, oh. you know, it's almost like this general leap. That's exactly what I heard from the other side of the table. Oh, wow. And I looked over real quick and I looked back at Ryan, I looked back over at Patty and Rebecca and I went, he's right, isn't he? And they both nodded. Yeah, that's a great answer. Women want security. It's a basic need. And I thought, wow. And then it hit me like a thunderbolt. How did he know this? How did my 16 year old son, who is just getting started with life, and here I am, 49 years old, and I still don't have a clue that security is, 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 is what women want. So I asked my son, I said, Ryan, come on now. How did you know this? I mean, I know wisdom comes in strange places and you get inspired and you say things, but seriously, how did you know that women want security? And he said, oh, dad, it's so simple. All you have to do is walk into a room full of women. He says, every time I walk into a room full of women, all they hear him yelling for is security. <laughs> exactly. Yelling for security. That's what people want. They want grace. They want relationships. They want ownership. They want to feel like they have value and worth. They want to laugh. But ultimately, they want security. We all do. We all long for the grouse. And if you feed the need, you'll never have to feed the greed again. Gimmicks and guilt, they work. They work. But only for the short term. And you usually have to keep upping up a notch, bigger and better, to make it work next time. But if you feed the need, if you feed the need, if you feed those growls, you'll free people to their greatest potential and productivity. Bye.